let me uh, put my screen on the, the the side for you. You should be able to see this um, on your screen. Um, I want to share with you um, probably the most popular resource on my website. Um, and there's a QR code in the top right hand corner, which will take you to the actual resource itself. So um, I shared this about 15 years ago. Um, Although the dialogue um, regarding lesson plans has kind of shifted dramatically, um, at least here in the UK over the last decade, and I suspect that dialogue may be different uh, in your context, it's planning lessons is still a major burden for teachers, particularly teachers who are new to the profession. Uh, some have a curriculum structure, others have nothing. Uh, and I think as teachers kind of master their subject knowledge as well as managing student behavior, Planning a coherent sequence of lessons alongside a kind of busy curriculum can lead to lesson planning becoming a serious workload burden. You'll often find many teachers not only just kind of catching up with their day-to-day -day work after school hours, but often uh, spending their Sunday, uh, their Sunday or Saturdays uh, kind of planning lessons for the week ahead. All teachers need to enter a lesson, a classroom in some shape or form with a plan. Uh, and this can be challenging when you're doing this for about 20 hours uh, each week. So I want to share with you an updated version which I've prepared exclusively for the Teacher Tech Summit. And this is inspired by my work with teachers across the globe uh, to reduce this workload issue for you and redesign lesson planning, which is informed not only by my own uh, work with teachers, my own life in the classroom, but also by research and some cognitive science. And I hope that the five minute lesson plan essentially kind of changes your work in life. Um, so what I'm going to do for you, I'm just going to kind of skip a couple of this quick slide introduction. I'm going to send this to you all at the end. I just want to talk briefly about the three approaches to lesson planning. Now, again, this will be different depending on where you uh, teach. But at least here in the UK, when we train to be teachers and we may have an observer or a coach alongside us, this is a classic example on the left hand side about a decade ago where this was required for formal observations if you had your line manager watching you. Now, many trainee teachers still have to prepare lesson plans in this depth to demonstrate that they can think clearly about their lesson structure and also provide this as evidence towards qualification. And this will look differently uh, in your own context. It may be totally alien to you also and um, but this was very real for many teachers here across the uk about 10 years ago and for new teachers still uh, entering the teaching profession here in the uk this is what it currently looks like now i'm not abandoning or totally advocating to get rid of teachers to be qualified and to think carefully about how they sequence their curriculum but this example here on the left is you know could perhaps take a new teacher anything between 30 minutes to maybe two hours. And the lesson itself with your children might just be, you know, 30, 30 or 60 minutes. On the other extreme, you have what I call doorknob lessons. Uh, and let's face it, uh, people with experience watching, you'll have done this in some shape or form. You've arrived to your lesson, touched a doorknob and literally made something up as you go along because you're relying on your experience. Uh, uh, a lovely Latin word I like to use is phrenesis. Phrenesis means professional wisdom. So as you get lots of confidence and experience, you can sometimes go in and go into autom automatic pilot and narrate the lesson, I suppose. Um, but I, I guess that extreme on the left uh, and the extreme on the right, that they're, they're, they're not sustainable. Uh, you cannot continue to produce this detail on the left hand side for one off lesson plans on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just not possible. On the right-hand side, it's not fair for your students or it's not good for your mental health because let's face it, if you go in with a plan and you have 30 students or maybe more in front of you, if you're lecturing a, a, a kind of larger number of students, it's gonna be, a, uh, it's gonna put you under quite a lot of anxiety to think on your feet. And that, you know, we know teaching is exhausting, but this is on the right-hand side, gonna even burn you out much quicker. So the five minute lesson plan, myself working with lots of new teachers throughout my leadership career as a deputy uh, or a vice principal, deputy head teacher, we call this here in England. Um, I designed the five minute lesson plan. This was inspired by a couple of other colleagues that I was working with in about 2007. 
And I shared this um, image here on social media. And although the, the title, the five minute lesson plan is quite elusive, it does, uh, and quite romantic, it does take a bit of practice to get to this point where you can scribble um, the details on a five minute lesson plan and kind of sit nice and comfortable between these two polar opposites. So what I'd like to do to, with you this, um, for me this afternoon, uh, it might be the evening where you're watching. Um, I want to just take you through the methodology and then as ever, there's a QR code and I'll send you the links and resources uh, via the chat box as we go through. Um, so let me just uh, take you through step by step. So I'm doing a little bit of kind of dual coding here, which is supported by cognitive research to reduce your working memory and present one or two aspects as we go along. So by the end of this, next 10 minutes, this page, this slide will be full. So the first stage is the big picture. Now the big picture is, you've already hopefully, fingers crossed, you've got your curriculum plan in place by your government, fingers crossed, and all the exam uh, bodies that you have in your own country. And then hopefully within your school, college, university setting, you have some medium plan schemes of work in place. These are your roadmaps. Uh, I have worked in some schools where they don't have these in place, and this puts teachers under sig more significant pressure. Uh, so having those in place then allows you to then think, well, there's the roadmap. Here's the medium term for the next 10 or 12 weeks for the term ahead. How do I then take this information and plan the lesson that I have with my students on Monday morning? I need to know the prior knowledge, what schema, so what knowledge and prior and prior concepts and higher order thinking I need to develop with my students. I also have to take into account the group of students, how many students, the dynamics, their needs, and the timings of the lessons. I mean, how long is your lesson? Some lessons are 15 minutes. Countries I've visited in Belarus or in other parts of the world, uh, they can range from 15 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes, or in a vocational setting, it could be all day. So context is key. So the big picture is essentially the lift pitch. Describe to me your lesson in 30 seconds. Now I just will add, although I'm taking 10 minutes to go through describing this to you with practice, and at the end of the slideshow when I, when I share it through the chat, you'll get the blank template. The purpose is to kind of think through, scribble your thoughts and have a five minute version that it sits between these two polar extremes, the detailed plan and the doorknob lessons. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the ground zero, the big picture. Stage one is your objective. So what we need to do, what re research recommends here is we need to break down into small steps what the key aspects we want students to learn. And the thing that I'm gonna really emphasize here is what do you want students to learn, not do? Okay, there's a big difference between learning and doing. And I think when it comes to learning, we also need to specify very clearly what it is we're learning. And if you're an observer, someone who watches other teachers, it's important also to specify what exactly it is that you are evaluating when you're observing another teacher. So if I said we were learning maths, well, what kind of maths, quadratic equations, okay, what type of, etc. So we need to break it down into small uh, steps. The key thing, I'm going to come back to this point on retrieval practice later. To strengthen our memory, we have to repeat. So you might call it rote learning, rehearsal, practice, repetition. To become better at something, you have to repeat. So in keeping with research on cognitive science from retrieval practice, the key thing for teachers explicitly is to ensure that your students write it or say it. If I ask you to think of the second planet from the sun in our solar system. Well, I don't know if you're thinking about that question. So what I need to do in the classroom is make sure that you write it, say it to your friend in the class, or say it to me at the front as a teacher. And I need to check regularly for understanding. So a lot of research about nonverbal signals, hand gestures, these things make a big difference to cognitive load, work in memory, and also allow me to check where the students are in front of me. Okay, stage two, engagement. So um, I believe the most effective teachers tell stories. What do you remember from school? Is it things outside of the classroom or thing, or do you remember that lesson on photosynthesis in the science lab? Um, what teacher unlocked your potential, hooked you in, gave you that, that kind of life chance or that passion for your own subject? 
the most effective teachers tell stories and I'd often advocate when you're managing physically lots of students all together, some are late also, you need to get lessons off to a flying start. So get something planned that's engaging, enticing. It might be an object, an interactive video, uh, a sound, whatever it might be, the context matters. Um, try and bring the curriculum to life and hook kids in early. You might want to also leave the, the kind of key message of your story towards the end of the lesson or the lesson that follows. Uh, stage three, retrieval. So this is the first key moment in your planning. If we just ask children what, or students, I should say, what we learned today, that's easy. To shape memory, it, learning long-term retention should be hard. So we must ask, what did we learn last lesson? And again, we need to quiz this with our, with our students to check where they all are so that we can decide what to move, uh, where to move forward. Uh, I guess the key one here for me would be to ensure that you plan what the key thing is you will test when you next meet your students. Uh, stage four, presenting new material. So we know that, um, I'll come into modeling in a moment, but we need to show each stage in, in steps. So uh, in, in, uh, in the UK here, we have a, a children's program called Blue Peter, and they're always showing little models of things they've made as they present. Uh, so it's almost, I call it Blue Peter teaching. Here's one I made earlier. And you might not show the finished <clears throat> product, the assignment, the drama performance, or a table and chair if you're in a kind of practical classroom. You'll just show various steps as you go through forward. Um, stage five, planned modeling. So we know we can model. I can do hand gestures. I can pose a question. I can use my body and non-verbal signals to support and challenge students' motivations. I can use a visualizer. I'm obviously, uh, despite the uh, technical glitch at the start, I'm working online. I'm conscious of the various ways that I can model and scaffold ideas. One of the key tips here in stage five is to follow this great mantra, I do it first, watch me. Now we do it together and then you do it on your own and I will monitor your performance. So the kind of cog it's called cognitive apprenticeship where the expert, the teacher, guides the student towards a degree of expertise or mastery. Now there's something here called scaffolding fading. Scaffolding is your range of resources, whether it's a question, a physical worksheet, maybe how you present your physical uh, body language to the students, uh, and you need to work out when to introduce these things, when to take them away, what to use uh, as children develop expertise. There's a term called fading. Uh, as you develop uh, kind of feedback and coaching methods with these students, you're going to start to reduce your support to develop their metacognition, to develop their own thinking as they move towards mastery. I guess, you know, with a better understanding of memory, I think if you put me in a corner and said, what's the key thing apart from behavior and subject knowledge all teachers would master? It's the ability to ask a wide range of questions. And it's not the number of questions, it's the type of questions. What if, how could, why, did you choose A instead of B, et cetera, et cetera. Um, stage seven, now there's a lot of things that I could include in here. Use of ICT, the developing the whole child, personal, social, sex, health, education, et cetera, et cetera. But if I just kind of squeeze into this area, literacy, numeracy, I'm a big fan of etymology, uh, etymological meaning, the word phrenesis I mentioned earlier, professional wisdom. Oracy, we should make our classrooms a speech community. We cannot leave developing children's schema to chance. So it's important that we practice or oracy, uh, writing, spelling, etc., to develop students' uh, performance. The same with numeracy and all aspects of school life. But that one, we want to develop literacy and numeracy in all our students around the world. That needs a, a central focus. All teachers are teachers of numeracy and literacy, whatever subject you teach. Um, interventions, this is your scaffold in a bit more deeper. You can't support all your students in the class, sadly. Most teachers want to. We know it's our moral compass. That's what makes us want to teach. But physically, I can't individually ask 30 questions give individual 30 scripts. And this is why teachers suffer from the marking burden. We have to try and do this physically when we write comments in pupils' work. So we need to approach our classrooms from three angles. Uh, in England, we have something called high, middle, low attainers, but I'd probably trump this and say, you're gonna have many students that are experts and can go off with your instruction, 
one or two students might have some misconceptions, so you'll clarify this, then they'll go off and complete your activity. And then you'll have students that may still struggle and need extra support regardless of what you do. So perhaps approach your interventions, whether it's worksheets, types of questions, from a three-pronged approach. Uh, some people will be familiar with the term differentiation. Uh, I think there's lots of myths about this. Of course, we want to support our students, but maybe over a period of time rather than a one-off episode. Um, stage nine, back to this retrieval. I called it stickability on the five-minute lesson plan. Make content stick. What is the key thing we want to learn? How are we going to test this? When are we going to recap on the next lesson, developing the higher order thinking? Uh, there's a great research term called spacing, space practice. So thinking about your curriculum sequence, what am I testing from last lesson? Where are the students going next? What do I need to keep recapping, requizzing on to see where they are to decide what to do next? And then the final stage, everybody, is think about your lessons, uh, your time that you have available, the sequence or the flow. Um, you, you may have a 60 minute lesson. So think about dividing that lesson into chunks. Now, most adults and uh, uh, use this use this very broadly, please. Um, think about cognitive load and working memory. We can only store so many pieces of information in our working memory and manipulate it at any one time. The research I read is between three and nine pieces of information. So I'm conscious that all this stuff already um, is lots of information for you. So I'd encourage you to watch back the whole video from this conference today to take more things away so that you can then enrich your practice. But think about working memory in your classroom. How do you design the lesson to flow to give children time to think, students time to think, as well as you to provide explicit instruction? I guess a couple of tips there. My favorites is, is the KISS theory, keep it simple, stupid. Or I use MINT, M-I-N-T, materials, are you in or out of your seats, noise level, and time. And these are great ways for scripting direct instruction, being clear and precise about the learning. So that's it, everybody. The, the, that's the kind of key uh, graphic. I guess at the back of the slides, if I could just whiz through, all the slides I'm going to send to you are all here explained in a bit more depth. And at the back, you've got um, a blank template where you can print it off, uh, redesign it or scribble onto it. And, and the link that you need is um, this one here. I'll just make sure that uh, I send this in the chat box. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I'll share it there in that chat box with the host, and they can put that on uh, to the light link for everybody. But that's it. Five-minute lesson plan, folks. Um, I think, you know, regardless of where you work, all teachers struggle with workloads. I think what we all need to do is try and make that uh, life as a teacher much easier. Uh, these are just my own experiences. I think teaching is a team sport. It's important that we share our wisdom. And I think, you know, going back to that point, Vic has made about 45,000 teachers on this conference. It's fantastic. And, you know, teachers who can mobilize themselves can really shape policy. So if we can kind of take this huge audience back to our own kind of countries and take this in another context, we can really influence government policy and make the life of teachers easier, more better rewarded, whether it's terms and conditions, and a more fulfilling and kind of better status in our society. Um, we all do amazing work. Um, thank you for uh, listening to me. Apologize for the technical glitch at the start. And I hope, I wish you all the very best for the rest of the conference. I'll be tuning in to see what um, everyone's got to say. So thank you very much. Ross, that was wonderful. I love how you not only walked us through such a great framework, but the visual presentation was just so beautiful. So thank you for sharing that. You know, you, you touched on this one thing that the teacher workload right now it, it is so heavy. It's so heavy. And I'm curious, you know, I love how you've mapped everything out so nicely. At a time when people, I think, are having to like think about balancing a lot of priorities, right? Whether it's the technology, they're thinking about social emotional learning, they're thinking about the content they have to cover, the skills, like we're constantly hearing about all the things today's learners need. How might somebody be able to leverage a tool like this or think about a tool like you've just shared to think about how to balance the many different priorities so that they don't see them as mutually exclusive, but rather a holistic experience? It's a, it's a very good question. Now, um, I'm going to put another ch ch uh, link in the chat box um, for the host to share, but I've actually thought about all aspects of school life and I've created other templates 
to help teachers manage um, managing behavior, managing marking, uh, inspections, I'm trying to think of others, uh, doing an assembly, a public assembly uh, for the first time. You know, if you've not done these things before, they're quite nerve wracking and they can make, you know, you know, we talk about mental health for teachers. It's a very stressful um, industry. So we need to share our wisdom, but also create little methods where we can make complex tasks a bit easier to manage. So the five minute lesson plan, when I published it, I think today it's had over two million downloads, which is just crazy. But it just shows you also that um, it's a, a really useful tool for helping uh, make complex tasks easier to kind of construct. Uh, I, I guess the kind of question, you know, on balancing and some of the things that I've seen, uh, I've probably worked with about 30,000 teachers face to face in the last three years, you know, before the pandemic in the last year about 10,000 online in, in, in about 60 different countries. And one thing that I know is that marking drives all teachers crazy, regardless of context. Of course, there'll be different influences and different forces um, and different pressures from external uh, observers, whether that's your school or college leaders, inspections, or even, dare I say, parents. I, I think we need to all ban the word marking and instead replace it with feedback because we know that feedback can be written, which is your marking, verbal, I can talk to you about your work, or non-verbal, well done. Uh, and we can also talk about feedback, feed up, feed forward. So there's at least six different types. So there's, I think once we also upskill and share our wisdom, we can then start to influence parents, policymakers, and try to make you know, the life of a teacher much easier. You know, a lot of people forget that although we're all just three of us on this little camera here and there's a lot of people watching, uh, the life of a teacher, there's 30 kids around them all the time, if not more, and trying to do all your day-to-day -day tasks uh, is a real headache and uh, is exhausting. So um, I think people outside the system need to always remember, let's add 30 kids into our little office space here and let's go about our day-to-day -day work. It's a bit like how we've all managed the pandemic with homeschooling people that are parents watching. It's it's hard work. It's full on. Um, so that's that's pretty much how teachers live on a daily basis. Well, thanks a lot, Ross. I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us here today. But before you before you end, I want to show you the uh, the results of the live poll okay. uh, that we have. And what we asked was, which of these best statements best describes the quality of your teaching during the pandemic? And of all the teachers that have responded, 91% you know, have said the experience has made them a better teacher. Right. Are, are, you, are you surprised with that? No, I'm not, because I think, you know, you think about how we've all adapted to the technology and the circumstances. Teachers are very talented people. They've got a wide range of skills. And now I'm not full time in the classroom and I'm working, you know, consultancy, author, blogger, you know, podcaster, all the different hats I've got on. And, you know, also trying to navigate, uh, Saba, congratulations on your doctorate. I, I'm, in, I'm in the middle and I've just hit a wall and I'm, I'm getting really demotivated about mine. So I've got many hats on. Um, but teachers are very talented people. And I think once you get time to reflect, you know, now I'm outside the classroom, I can think of, wow, I've actually learned loads in my teaching career and my leadership where I've got a wide range of skills. So I think teachers, you know, apart from the initial shock for us all and then responding to the technology, wh whether you had it or not, in your school or in your country's infrastructure, you know, the, the, the emergence of technology is fast for us all to keep up, but there's tons of stuff out there. I think it's about filtering the good ideas to the top so we know, oh, that one works, it's gonna reduce your workload and make a great difference to your kids. And I think, you know, it's not been the story for everybody, but the vast majority of us have, have re you know, I've been doing webinars for 10 years, but everyone's been doing them all the time, full time for the last 12 months. So now we're all up to speed, which is great. But, uh, you know, what's the next thing? You know, uh, we won't go into that, but, uh, you know, hologram teaching and whatever else it might be. But that, that's the future we still got to discover. And that's why we're here today.